All right, can we hear us now? I can keep talking if that's helpful. Okay, cool. So we're back. Pretend that the last few minutes never happened and we're going to start again. So um, a little bit about me, I guess, before we, we get into things here for a little bit of context, why I'm even standing up here talking to you. Um, I wear a lot of different hats. So I do work at Wilfrid Laurier University in the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies as a lab coordinator. And I also manage a lot of research um, out of that office. And kind of complementary to that, I also work at Western University as a project coordinator on Park Seat Canada, which is a pan-Canadian initiative looking at the accessibility and quality dimensions of parks, protected areas, and recreation facilities. And we'll talk about that a little bit later today. Um, and in the meantime, I'm also a PhD student at Western in the same department, um, also working on my PhD. So my research interests really look at health promotion in parks and protected areas and kind of everything that goes along with that planning and management, the health and well-being benefits, outcome, education, getting people into that space. Next slide. Um, so today we're really going to talk about those dynamics that you can't ignore as Trevor kind of alluded to. We're going to talk about getting people into parks, but also in a way that kind of maintains that ecological integrity and those ecosystems that we're really trying to protect in the first place. So what I'd like to do today is almost take a little bit of a stock take of kind of where we're at with things, um, framing that in the idea of health promotion, health and well-being benefits, and borrowing a little bit from the Healthy Parks, Healthy People movement and a recent paper that we published. I'm going to briefly talk about the role of protected areas in this, and then we're going to talk about a little bit of progress and evidence that we're building towards the value that protected areas play in those health and well-being benefits. And then we'll talk about the challenges or opportunities to put it in a more positive light and a bit of next steps and action agenda moving forward. OK, so I don't really need to spend very long talking about the health and well-being benefits of nature. As Trevor mentioned, you can't argue with it. So my presentation is done. No, OK, we'll tell you a little bit about it. <laughs> Um, so it's really no surprise. Obviously, we get a lot of health and well-being benefits from being out in nature. This is promoted right on the Ontario Parks website. It's promoted on Parks Canada's website. We're seeing a lot of traction being gained there. And of course, protected areas and parks play a great role in that. They're a vital resource. They protect ecosystem services, and they provide a very designated place for that recreation activity for people to get together and enjoy their time. Okay. That being said, though, the full benefits really remain quite unclear. OK, so if we look at the situation that we're dealing with today, just globally in a Canadian context, we're seeing a lot of chronic health issues in the Canadian population. We're seeing a way more sedentary lifestyle. It's great that some of you did get outside on your break, but for most of us, we at least got out of our chairs. We talked to one another. We moved around, um, but we really haven't left the confines of this room today. 
And so that's creating a lot of problems. Okay? It's creating health problems for us as a population. And it's also creating this disconnect with nature. We're not necessarily seeing the value of it, even though it's starting to become a little bit more well known. And we in this room can probably easily say, okay, yeah, there are a lot of health and well-being benefits. Why, why do we need to discuss this? But the general population actually doesn't see that connection yet. It's not made very clear. And this comes back to some of the communication that Liz was alluding to this morning. And then, of course, we have COVID-19 and the pandemic over the last few years. And so while that has kind of ramped up that visitation to parks, um, it's also created a lot of health problems for us and a lot of other problems. And I think we can all agree that we're very fatigued, both physically and mentally at this point as well. So the reality is there's compelling evidence that contact with nature can offer human health and well-being benefits, but evidence on the role that Canada's protected areas play particularly in the health and well-being benefits um, actually remains really limited. And further investigation into those health and well-being benefits is needed. So things like environment type. Okay, what kinds of environments do people want to spend their time in? What eludes the most benefit? Uh, the quality of those environments. So the naturalness, the ecological integrity, the species diversity, biodiversity that's there. The activity type. Does it matter if you're walking, if you're hiking, swimming, just sitting around enjoying a campfire? But we also need consistent methodologies in this. So there really isn't one way right now that we're measuring those health and well-being benefits. And I'm going to show you a few examples today of how I've measured it, very different than what you're going to read in other studies as well, all kind of giving us that step forward, um, but not necessarily a consistent voice. And of course, that public awareness and education. So it's great that we can sit here as practitioners and academics and say, OK, this is what we know, this is what we need to do. But how do we move that a step further into the actual public and getting them on board? So overall, more research is needed in terms of understanding visitor experiences and environmental attributes in influencing health and well-being. And of course, we can apply this beyond protected areas as well, right? To any green or blue space, anywhere that you're receiving those benefits of nature. The next slide. Okay, so we're going to talk about progress a little bit. Um, so I did mention that there haven't been a lot of studies done in Canada on the role that protected areas play, but there have been some. So I'm going to use some examples, uh, mostly from my own research and from that of a few of my colleagues, to kind of demonstrate what we have been finding so far and kind of why we need to keep going another step further. So first and foremost, we'll use an example from my own master's research uh, that I did at Wilfrid Laurier University under Dr. Chris Lemieux and Sean Doherty. And basically what we're looking at here is linking restorative human health outcomes to protected area ecosystem diversity and integrity. So in this study, we had four main objectives that we wanted to look at. Restoring, we wanted to look at the restorative outcomes perceived by visitors while experiencing different environments within the park. So again, getting at that different environment type. We wanted to look at the variations in those differences by sociodemographic variables and self-reported physical and mental health. We wanted to look at the influence of perceived ecological integrity, naturalness, and species richness of those environments on visitor experience. And then we wanted to look at the influence of the length of visit or the dosage on visitor experiences and restorative outcomes. So we conducted the study in the summer of 2016. Team. Time is actually flying by um, at Pinery Provincial Park in uh, just outside of Grand Bend in Ontario here. And Pinery attracts over 600,000 visitor days annually. So it makes one of the fourth largest provincial parks uh, visited in Canada. It consists of 19 unique ecosites within this one park. Okay, um, So very fine level. We've got freshwater coastal dunes, um, oak savanna, for example. And what we did here is we used kind of a place-based study in situ surveying where we actually went out with uh, tablets and we surveyed people in the parks on a next available basis and basically just asked them to fill out a quick 10 to 12 minute survey asking them about their experiences, their perceptions, of the environment that they were in and their perceived health and well-being benefits while they were out there. So here we used what was called restorative outcome scale or ROS scale to measure the health and well-being benefits. Um, and essentially what the ROS scale does is it has visitors rate their level of disagreement or agreement with statements such as, I feel calmer here, I feel more relaxed here, I forget everyday worries here. Yes. I also have to go on to the next slide. Okay, so just a quick oh, one back. 
Uh, so just a quick kind of profile here of what we found. Our sample size was 467 participants. And basically our sample represented a pretty uh, representative sample of visitor profiles for Pinery and kind of Ontario parks in general. Um, the average age was 44 with a higher proportion of females. Most were Ontario residents, although we did have um, some visitors from other provinces and particularly in the States, given its close proximity to the border. And almost 70% were returning visitors. So there's already some buy-in right there. And as you see at the bottom of the slide, 95.5% feel that visits to natural areas are important for improving aspects of health and well-being. So what I will say with this is right off the bat, um, we are in the park already as we're doing this visitation. So we've kind of got buy-in from these people um, in terms of the importance of this. And this is why it's in interesting to see how they rate their own physical, mental health, and the stress leading up to their visits so that we can then kind of see how that changes once we're in the park environment. So overall, most of the participants felt that, you know, they had good to excellent mental health, a little bit less on the physical health side, about 51%, and 36 reported being stressed in the week prior to their visit. So maybe that park time was definitely needed. So if we look at the restorative outcomes, scale from visiting a protected area, what we found here is that restorative outcomes of being in pinery are high. Okay? You are going to get those benefits. People did feel calmer. They forgot their everyday worries. They felt more relaxed when they were there. But when we start breaking that down between those finer scale eco sites um, that you see on your right hand side, there's not a lot of difference between them. So it didn't make a ton of difference if you decided that you're going on a trail versus being at one of the beaches or being on your campgrounds. Being out in this environment had a lot of benefits, which is great news. And it did start to differ a little bit by visitors' preference of the environment um, and visitors' opinions on the importance of visiting that natural area. So again, if you felt that it was important to be there, you tended to have higher restorative outcomes. We've got that buy-in. Everyone will benefit. Um, ROS was high regardless of self-reported physical or mental health or stress levels. So whether they reported having low physical mental health going into the trip um, versus high, they still reported receiving restorative outcomes. So that's particularly great for that part of the population that does experience stress, that does feel that their mental, their physical health is low. They're going to be able to hopefully improve that, maybe move it up a notch by going out to these natural spaces. And if you're already feeling great, you're going to continue to feel great. It's a win-win situation. When we break down between gender, females did receive greater outcomes, particularly in the uh, sub ROS scales of my concentration and alertness clearly increases here and my thoughts are clear and clarified here. And so we can kind of think about this. This could be because you're kind of outside of the home. Maybe uh, you don't need to worry as much about, you know, the family getting to school, doing all the schedules, what have you. Um, it could also just be that females feel that they get more benefits from being out in parks. What's really interesting about our research here, though, is if we look at the kind of um, ecological integrity, the naturalness, the species richness that we asked our participants to look at, there was a strong association between restorative outcomes and that perceived quality of the environment. So what we found was that visitors that perceived the environment they were in to have uh, better quality, that it had more species richness, that it was more natural, also tended to report higher restorative outcomes. Now, this is particularly important because, as we know, we have a bit of a dual mandate. We have that dynamic um, in our park system that we both want our visitor experiences. We want our visitors coming into the park. We want that revenue that comes from it. However, we also need to protect those ecosystems and have that ecological integrity. And what this is saying is that visitors also appreciate that. They respect that. They want it as well. They want those natural environments. They perceive that quality to play an important role in their visit. So how do we then kind of translate that into something we can execute? And in terms of getting the right dosage, again, we found high restorative outcomes for day users and campers. However, the number of days spent in provincial, national, or similar parks per year, uh, whether it was one day versus two or more, did have a weak but positive correlation. So again, we've got that bit of buy-in there. People are enjoying spending time in these environments. They see it as important, and so they see the benefits that come with it. 
Okay, so all in all, what we found here is that there's high restorative outcomes. So again, we're building that case for support that there are health and well-being benefits from being out in these park environments. And again, there's not a ton of research done on this in Canada yet. So while this seems like an obvious outcome in a lot of ways, it's still important to build that evidence when we start looking at making policy management decisions and getting that information out into the public. The finer scaled ecocyte type, though, didn't have a huge determining factor. Now, it's not to say that being in different kinds of environments don't play a role. Um, coastal versus terrestrial parks may certainly make a difference in terms of people's health and well-being benefits. But at this fine scale, it doesn't necessarily matter. And if you've ever visited Pinery Provincial Park, if you didn't know it, you might not always realize that you were in different ecocytes, especially depending on your goal in terms of getting out into that park. So this makes a lot of sense. That length of stay um, didn't have a huge effect irrespective of physical and mental health and stress. So again, we're all going to see those benefits from it. But again, what's really important here is that perceived ecological integrity, perceived environmental quality. Okay, That is something that we found that was novel in our, our study and something that we definitely need to kind of pursue further because there hasn't been a lot of other work done on it and not a lot done prior to this one. So visitors' perceptions and beliefs are important in this. And, you know, I, I don't think this is new. I think we know that they play a huge role in, you know, our park visits and in the management decisions that we make and the planning for it. But we need to find a way to translate that from, you know, idea and theory into practice. Now, our findings are consistent with some results that are emerging. We have now done over 2,000 visitors surveyed um, in Canada across four different provinces. Some of this work was done by myself, some of it done by uh, Dr. Chris Lemieux and Mari Chandler, who will uh, be presenting later today. And what we're finding is that subjective health and well being benefits are substantial. So, consistently, we're finding that visitors are reporting high restorative outcomes or high health and well being benefits from being in these spaces. And visitors who tend to visit protected areas more frequently also tend to great get greater outcomes. So kind of that go back, step, repeat idea. Women also consistently receive greater motivations and outcomes from being in these spaces, particularly if we look at psychological, emotional, and social benefits. And particularly in the Alberta study, they also revealed that women kind of drive the decision making to visit parks and that parks are at the core of their identity. So again, when we're talking about marketing and promotion to the general public, they're an area that we might want to target a little bit. And again, results are also internationally consistent. So there have been some other studies that have adopted um, our methods, both in Finland and in Spain. And so again, we're starting to build this momentum of those benefits. But you know, again, there's a lot more work that needs to be done in Canada. These are only a few studies, and there's some others that have been done since this study. Again, it was done in 2016. Um, but we have a long way to go, and those consistent methods are going to play a really big factor in kind of being able to build this forward. Outside of just academic research, so initiatives are taking off. So again, we're talking about progress. What can we do? Well, we've got things like the park prescription program that uh, Dr. Melissa Lem has launched. It's now you know, spreading its way across the country. We have the Parks Canada that has announced the National Urban Parks Program and $130 million going towards that. So there's some great research being done there. And bringing that into more of an urban environment where our population can more easily and readily access these park spaces. This has always been one challenge when we look at our protected areas. They're not exactly close to us all the time. Okay, If I want to go to Pinery, I live in Waterloo, Ontario, and it's about an hour and 20 minute drive. So it's a day trip for sure. It's a great day trip, but it is a commitment. I have to go for the day as opposed to just going to walk the dog in the evening. So that was a great uh, thing to see. And then, of course, the consultation with the Healthy Parks, Healthy People movement um, that was launched in 2019. We've got some great feedback from that, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing where that strategic plan goes if I can ever get my hands on it. And then, of course, some of our other initiatives, very specific to Healthy Parks, Healthy People. Uh, we've got, you know, the annual free day use in July. Similar things going on in Alberta, the first day hike that is happening in January, kind of getting people outside in the winter months as well, when we tend to be a little bit more sedentary. And some of the other programs, such as Learn to Camp programs, which are encouraging people that are less familiar with camping or um, new Canadians to get out into these spaces and provide them with the tools and knowledge to be able to do that. So there's a lot of really great programming happening as well, and hopefully we continue to see that um, even kind of ramp up. Okay, so we talked about some of the progress so far, but there are some challenges.
challenges or as we'll call them opportunities in terms of actually getting people out into parks. And I titled my presentation today, Planning for People in Parks, Building Advocacy, Awareness and um, Opportunities to Get People into These Spaces. And, you know, I'll preface this right now by saying I don't have the answers. I will probably leave you with more questions today than anything else, but hopefully it gets us thinking about some of the next steps that we need to take. So the last few years have been rough. Okay? Um, COVID has done a number on our parks, both in terms of the environment itself and the staff. Obviously, we saw here in Ontario, as in many other provinces, that there was quite an influx of visitors to parks, both for day use and camping, a lot of first time visitors. And that also came with some problems, a lot of trash, a lot of um, camp equipment, just kind of abandoned, left there. And it really left um, also a burden on the park staff. I was out this summer doing field work in Saskatchewan, in New Brunswick, here in Ontario, and I heard the same thing all across the country is that they were short staffed. They could not find enough people to work for the summer to fill those positions and it's for all kinds of reasons including the simple fact that gas prices made it more expensive than it was worth to work for the summer but the problem with this is that that leaves our already limited resources in an even tighter fix so while it's great that our visitors got out to the parks it's like yes people are seeing that this is important they couldn't do anything else in the pandemic they got outside they made use of these spaces Hopefully they come back. We don't want them to come back quite this much. Okay. Little less, little less. So there needs to be some education awareness around that. And I think Ontario Parks, along with some other agencies, did a really great job in that. Um, their social media in particular, kind of communicating the challenges with that, what you need to do and what you need to think about when you're in these spaces. So yes, we want people in parks, um, but how do we do that in a way that is sustainable that makes sense for the park that they're at and again Trevor kind of alluded to this there are some parks that maybe just shouldn't have visitation whatsoever or maybe we need to encourage our visitors to go to some of the less visited places okay. but then we get into whole other issues of how do we make that happen how do we get them there how do they afford it see how this is becoming a problem so equity and social dimensions of of nature um, it's a complex topic, okay? There's a lot of different things that are going on right now. And when we look at equity, including the access to protected areas and full participation in decision making, it's a complex topic that we're not going to solve overnight if we ever come up with one solution at all. It probably won't happen. And unfortunately, what we've seen is an overrepresentation in our parks, um, you know, both in terms of staffing, but also in visitors by affluent young white male able-bodied populations okay that kind of has traditionally been the makeup of the park visitor and we're starting to see that change for sure um, again women are getting the most benefit out of being in these spaces okay we're seeing more families we are seeing things like uh, those learn to camp programs you know new canadians coming into that space and i think there's a lot more room um, for everybody but there are some challenges with that and particularly visit uh, barriers around visitation. So when we're talking about barriers, these can be any number of things um, and, and this is for everybody, but travel, for example. So getting to a park, okay, do they have access to public transportation? Are they going to be able to walk, take a bike? Uh, do they have a vehicle? Okay, can they rent a vehicle? And again, the time that goes into that. Are we talking about a, you know, 20 minute, one hour trip? Are we talking about a trip that is going to take a full day? Do we need to take a week off? Do we need to take a week off of work? And then do we have the time to be doing that? Okay, it kind of starts to get a little bit complicated here. Um, and the fees associated with it. Okay? So paying for your entry fee, your camping fee, paying for firewood, um, paying for the equipment that goes into it. And there's some rental programs starting to become available as well. The libraries are also starting to have seasonal passes available that you can take out for a day, which I think is awesome. And then there are some more significant barriers in terms of feeling safe, in terms of feeling um, welcome, included. Okay? We have um, many populations that report that they don't feel represented in parks. They don't feel as though they belong there, that they don't feel safe. And so we need to start to, to move the needle on that. We need to find a way that these spaces can become 
accessible in an equitable way for everybody. Because again, if we go back to my original argument of the health and well-being benefits and being out in parks and protected areas, that applies to all people all over the planet. So everybody should have access to these health resources, this health promotion. And we do have inconsistencies in the park planning as well. So while there are a lot of great programs in place, they're usually very specific to individual parks and the resources available and to park agencies. Uh, what you see happening in Pine Ridge Provincial Park, for example, is going to be different from Algonquin or Wenda that's going to shut down a little bit earlier. It's going to be different from what you see out in New Brunswick, where Fundy National Park is way more prominent than the provincial parks that they have there. So while we want to offer different things, we want to have that diversity. We want to make sure that it is relevant to what is actually available at the park, to that eco site and to the visitors that they have. We also want to make sure that there's some consistency in that everybody is having those opportunities and having that access and where possible, those personal communications and interactions. And policy and planning initiatives are limited. So if we go back to this idea of the Healthy Parks, Healthy People framework, um, in a paper we recently published, we were looking at the progress and the challenges of this movement over the years across Canada. And the reality is, is that this movement has stalled in a lot of ways. It got really great uptake um, across Canada, you know, a lot of great initiative. And I would argue that Ontario has definitely championed it. It has the most robust and consistent um, planning and, and policies around this. But you don't see that across the country in a lot of other provinces. Again, when I was out in New Brunswick, I was talking to um, the provincial planners there and they had Healthy Parks, Healthy People Day. They had some initiatives there, but, you know, funding went, people changed roles and now they would like to get it back, but they're not quite there yet. So we need to build some momentum there and some consistency. And realistically, despite some, some progress, um, overall it has stalled when it comes to the Healthy Parks, Healthy People movement and the frameworks that go along with it in those policy and planning initiatives. Okay, so an action agenda then. Next steps, what can we actually do to move this forward a little bit? So I put up the Healthy Parks, Healthy People framework from Parks Victoria um, in Australia because I like it, quite frankly. It's a little bit messy. There's a lot going on in it. Um, but it also includes a lot of the different aspects that we're talking about here today and that we want to think about when we're actually planning for people in our parks. So if we look at the healthy people side of it, you know, we've got things like being active in nature, access for all, learning in nature, okay, volunteering in nature. So going beyond just, you know, experiencing it for yourselves, but actually contributing, giving something back. On the healthy park side, though, we've got the maintenance, um, we've got that living heritage, managing for species, et cetera. And so we want to make sure that we're kind of marrying that together in a way that makes sense for everybody, having the nature, the people, and the culture, including those ideas of, you know, activating the programs and building awareness and evidence that goes around with it. So is there probably better frameworks out there? Or could we create one? Yes, but I think this is a great starting point when we're kind of thinking about where do we still need to go? What are we currently missing in our frameworks here in Canada? What are we not um, moving forward in our conversations and in our actions that we can start to draw on. So really, when we look at kind of the future of, of research and what needs to happen next, I mean, there's a lot, but expanding and being consistent around our current body of knowledge. Okay, there is a lot more work that needs to be done in, in this regard. Um, again, we do need to have those consistent methodologies when we're actually measuring health and well-being or having a few different methodologies that make sense. We need to better understand visitor demographics. Oftentimes this is not shared with the public, so the data that is collected from different park agencies isn't shared with the public, it isn't shared with us um, as academics or practitioners unless we kind of request it and even then it's you know a refined version of. And this is really important because if we have this information in a way that is uh, appropriate and respectful and private, we can then start to better understand our, our visitors, our demographics, who is actually going to these spaces, who do we need to, you know, kind of advance their learning and understanding, but also who isn't going to these spaces, who are we missing at the table? And we need to focus on those equity deserving groups, which are often the ones missing at the table. They're not the ones in the space. And so the question is why? Is it 
because of barriers? Is it because of a lack of interest combination thereof? And looking at those some barriers and enablers to park access. So what encourages people to get out into these spaces? What organizations, what programs are currently underway? What initiatives that get you into parks? Is it as simple as some messaging, some knowledge that they're there and you can go see them? Um, do you need some assistance with that, such as those Learn to Camp programs? And what are the barriers? What do we need to start addressing to get people into these spaces? Looking more on the park planning and management side, though, we kind of need to look at this from a benefits based management approach. And that's not to say let's throw out all of the approaches that we already have. I'm not going to pretend to, you know, work in a park and understand what those decisions are like, what has to be thought of on a daily basis. But considering the benefits that our population gets from being out in these spaces and how can we get them out there in a way that makes sense for them that receives those those benefits but again also maintains the structure of the park and the goals that it is trying to achieve. Healthy parks, healthy people. Very simply put, we should really be advancing this movement. OK, it's a great um, umbrella to frame this under. There's some really great initiatives underway and it's international in scope. It's recognized all over the world. Lots going on in Australia, New Zealand, Finland and so if we can kind of tap into this and create some momentum there that goes countrywide, um, maybe it can start to get some traction. We can advance it a little bit further, a little bit faster. Maybe we can even get some money for it because I know that's kind of what it comes down to. We need some money. We need some resources, whether it be people, infrastructure, et cetera, to make this happen. And having this cross sector integration. So a lot of times we work in our silos. This is nothing new to us in academia and, and even in the government sector. Um, but we need to start including public health, for example. I come from a geography and environmental studies background, and so I definitely bring a unique social science perspective. Um, however, I am I'm not a public health officer. I don't have that kind of background. And so I need to have those dialogues with those other agencies to better understand the process that goes into place, the challenges that they are facing and what they're hearing from the public. And of course, education, interpretation, and outreach. And this goes from all sides. I'm not just talking about this in terms of interpretation programs within parks, but both internally and externally. So when we have visitors in parks, what do we need to tell them? But what do we also need to tell the public? And how do we reach that in an effective way? Not just passively in, in social media and websites, which are a great start, but how can we more effectively engage with the public on a regular basis to have these conversations, to build that understanding of the importance? Because if we think back to what I was talking about earlier in my own research, looking at the environmental quality and the health and well-being benefits, there's clearly a link there. But visitors and public in general don't tend to understand that if their environment is protected, okay, if it's made available to them, if all of its pieces are intact, it's also going to serve them better. There needs to be a little bit more of a holistic approach. Now, I did promise I'd talk about ParkSeek, um, so I'm going to use this opportunity to give a little bit of an elevator pitch. I've talked a lot about you know, some of the progress, some of the challenges we're facing, and the project I'm currently working on, ParkSeek Canada, does start to try to address some of this. We are by no means going to address all of it. We're not the answer, um, but it is a very exciting project that's underway that I think many of you in this room and online would um, benefit from and be interested in. So essentially the ParkSeek project is supported by the Public Health Agency of Canada. It's a four year project. We're actually already in year three, yay pandemic. And um, essentially what we want to do is build distinctly Canadian data sets, tools and approaches and knowledge about the links between parks and population health promotion. So really kind of continuing on building that evidence base. So we have three objectives in our rather massive study. Um, we are housed out of out of Western Ontario with Laurier being a hub of the project as well, but it is pan Canadian. So we have quite a number of uh, university partners, park agencies, nonprofits on board, um, municipalities, academics, students, you name it, the list goes on and on. So within these three objectives, then our first one is accessibility. We want to measure geographic accessibility to parks and recreation facilities across Canada. So geographic accessibility, as in kind of doing some GIS mapping, where are our populations, where are our parks? 
are they accessible? Looking at some transit mapping, for example, um, are they able to access it through public transportation, through alternative methods such as cycling, walking, um, etc. Our second objective is quality, and this is probably the biggest objective that we have. We want to gauge quality in 12 focus communities through on-site assessments, surveys, and a smartphone app. So when we talk about quality in this case, um, we are talking about the quality of the visitor experience. So kind of getting at their health and well-being, their motivations for visiting these spaces. What we've done here is taken 12 focus communities. This mostly comes down to time and money. We can't do everywhere in Canada. And we wanted to get a mix of rural, urban, divide, small, medium, large size populations, which I will show you in just a minute on, on the map. And essentially, we have first conducted a field audit um, of kind of a stock take, really, of what the parks, protected areas, recreation facilities in our sites have. So kind of going out, doing a survey, we spent many days this summer doing just that. What facilities are there? What's missing? Are there washrooms? Are they accessible? Are they open? Do they have um, universal access? Things like that. Are there park, are there playground facilities? Are there different sports courts? Things like that. We're also doing a national household survey that will be mailed out soon. Um, the national household survey is split into two. There's a more of an urban focus, urban environments and municipalities, and then a more protected areas focus. And what we're looking at with that is the barriers um, and enablers to getting out into these spaces. So both users and non-users looking at um, behaviors, patterns, motivations for being in these spaces or why they're not. So what's really great about this and what I'm most excited about, this is where some of my work comes in, is getting both at the user and the non-user, which has been really hard up until this point. As I was saying earlier in my research, we're talking to the people that are already in the parks. I want to talk to the people that aren't in the parks. Why aren't you in the parks? How can we get you there? And then our smartphone application is going to actually be an app that you can download on your phone. And when you're out in these different park spaces, you're going to get prompted very quickly uh, to fill out a very short, you know, five question type survey. How are you feeling in this moment? How are you enjoying your experience? What is making this memorable for you? So please do keep an eye out on that. And when it comes available, download it, help us out. We need some data. And then finally, that policy piece. So we're going to inventory, evaluate and share plans, policies and programs at all levels of government. And really what we want to do here is kind of pull on municipal parks and rec master plans, um, provincial and national plans, what there is of it, and assess us through a health equity lens using a progress plus framework. And essentially what we want to see here is kind of the state of where we're at in terms of our policies and health equity and where can we go forward. We're hoping to be able to share this through a database with our all of our partners and our practitioners afterwards and kind of use this as a best practice knowledge sharing platform. What do we have? What is working in other places? What can we build on going forward? So just to kind of round that off, um, just thought it would be worth kind of putting up the 12 communities that we have been working in. We do have quite um, a diver diverse sample across the country. So kind of working, you know, west to east, we have Whitsett First Nation in North Vancouver and BC, the Detcho region in Northwest Territories, Prince Albert and Saskatoon, um, Saskatchewan, where I got to spend some time in the summer, Winnipeg, Manitoba, London, since it is our flagship where Western University is held. Rouge Valley for more of that urban national park perspective in with Whitchurch Stouffville area, Montreal, Quebec, um, Bay of Fundy, and then Halifax. And so we're really working along that nature continuum all the way from more of the urban parks, uh, municipal recreation facilities into the provincial parks and, and national parks scale. Any publicly accessible and owned space. So if you think back to those objectives I just mentioned, um, both the accessibility and policy are pan-Canadian in scope, whole country. Objective two, the quality with the app and the field audits we're doing specifically in these 12 communities based on just time and funding. Um, but that survey will be going out to a nationally representative sample of Canadians, both sampling within these communities as well as just a wide sample across the country. OK, so as I mentioned, I probably left you with more questions and things to ponder, or at least I hope I did um, than I answered. I will say we don't really have all the answers right now. A lot of this stuff that we still need to work on. We're always going to be working on it. Um, this is where some of the Park Seek research comes in, looking at those barriers and enablers and kind of driving this forward as, as well as many other research projects that are going on right now. 
So I would just encourage you to uh, keep an eye out for all of that information coming in the next year or so. And please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about anything you heard today or for the project a little bit further. Thank you for your time. Uh, for anybody who would like to sort of online or in person ask Catherine some questions, we have the time. I'm going to take off my mask. Thanks for, for an interesting presentation. I'm wondering, and this is kind of just tidbits I've read in the news that some jurisdictions, some some doctors in some jurisdictions are like prescribing outdoor time as a as a way to combat some mental health issues and stuff like that. Do you know of anything going on in that sense in Canada? And and if there is, like that would be kind of the perfect opportunity to to get more of a control data set of, um, you know, those that are prescribed outdoor time and those that are not, what are their different health outcomes? Yeah, um, so the, the park prescriptions that I was mentioning earlier, uh, Dr. Melissa Lem is leading those out in BC and she's got a lot of traction with that and it's really spreading across the country. I'm not sure if it's made it to Ontario fully yet, um, but she's got agreements kind of with several different provinces. And so how that park prescription works is essentially you are connecting with a physician and they are prescribing you that time in nature, um, you know, for a wide variety of benefits based on their needs. I guess the only challenge with that, of course, is when we get into kind of the ethical realm of following around patients and, um, you know, their private information and their, their locations, that's always a challenge even with GPS research. But that would hopefully be kind of where we can move to a bit is that prolonged uh, result and that's part of even with ParkSeq the smartphone application that we're talking about that's the goal with it is so that we have a bit of a pre a during and a post to see how our visitors are actually enjoying their park environments and not just with one off right so you wouldn't go into a park once and say okay well I've done my survey I feel good I feel good in an hour we're done we want you to keep doing it we want you to do it the next time you go in the park the same park a different park a park you've never been to before um, and see if those outcomes you know, kind of continue on, but also if they replicate. So, yeah, no, it's a great question. I, I would encourage you to kind of go on her her website and follow her because she's just a wealth of knowledge. Okay, thank you. Got all the questions. Oh, great. That question online. Okay, great. They are in every province. Okay, question online. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, just wondering how the national survey is being distributed. What is the sampling method? <laughs> what is the sampling method? Um, so essentially we're distributing the national household survey in kind of a three prong approach. So we're going to be getting a nationally representative sample using um, a surveying company that we're working with and they'll kind of work to determine what that representative sample looks like. I haven't been too involved in those conversations just yet. Um, the second part of that though is getting a representative sample within those 12 communities that I mentioned and as well as some of the communities that um, Parks Canada is looking at for their national urban parks sites. We've been talking with them about kind of what that looks like in those communities. And so what we do with that is we try to get a nice diverse and mixed sample of um, minority groups and low and high socioeconomic groups. So looking at the census data and kind of being able to make sure that we're getting a nice mix of everything. So nobody's getting left out in those communities. Um, and then the third way is just honestly through word of mouth. So being able to send that out through social media um, with our partner organizations, being able to promote that through their websites, through their mailing lists and kind of drive traffic that way. Okay, thank you. I have another question online if we have time. Uh, great presentation. Is ParkSeq looking to pursue additional partner communities now or in the future? Yes, we are. Um, so 
currently our 12 are kind of our, our baseline are set, what we have promised to the Public Health Agency of Canada and what we can fund. Um, however, we are always looking for communities and we're happy to talk with any community that's interested about what that could look like um, in terms of the resources that we can provide to you to kind of get this off the ground and what we can provide in return in terms of, of reports. We are also hoping this is a bit of a springboard into further work. As I mentioned, you know, this is by no means the be all and end all. It's a big project, there's a lot going on, but we're really just building the, the baseline to be able to jump off into other projects. So yes, definitely, please get in touch with me if, if there's interest there. If we don't have any further questions online, Karen, or anything like no, that. We're good. All right, we're about actually at the time we were said we we're going to break for lunch, so I think we shall probably do that. Um, we'll cease recording here. And again, for those of you online, uh, you, of course, will not see us for about an hour and 10 minutes. So if you keep a reminder, we'll come back at uh, 1300 hours for this afternoon. We do have a bit of a roundtable discussion, which is sort of an interesting model for a hybrid, but I'm, I'm pretty sure we can manage it okay. I put a little question on that side of it and sort of thinking about sort of what we might be able to realistically do. One, one idea, what might you have, especially since we have a lot of park professionals, people who do operations and management and planning and so forth and so on. Uh, before we do break, because I don't like leaving this to the very end, we're not finished, of course, or anything like that. Uh, but I do want to thank Anya, Randy, and Karen who are in here and actually in this room who are helping us sort of monitor both the recording as well as sort of the online questions as well. To Matt, our excellent sort of technical help. Uh, thank you very much, Matt, for this morning. Uh, to Stephanie, who's actually also one of my students, is helping out actually this morning, actually advancing the slides. Uh, Jason Phoenix, who couldn't join us at least in person this morning, actually built the website, and so that's useful. Our, of course, uh, speakers this morning were all sort of extraordinarily wonderful, and I really thank you for all doing that as well. And I do thank all of you out there for participating in this particular uh, forum. It'll be nice to sort of see us resume this afternoon and see what else we can come up with. So I appreciate all of your particular efforts. Uh, one final thing I wanted to do, and, and Catherine, you, you mentioned the man himself here. Uh, that's Chris Lemieux, who um, is probably online. He was out, out, was out west the last we saw. Um, I do want to thank Chris because uh, he's been sort of a big supporter of this all the way back when it was actually in different formats. So Chris, to you out there, I want to thank you. And then finally, our advisory board uh, has been a big help in actually getting this meeting constructed as well. So I thank them too. Uh, I'm going to uh, cease speaking now and uh, we'll actually close it out for lunch break and then we'll resume again at 1300 hours. So thank you. <laughs>